Hello and welcome to the latest episode of The Shindig, which is a podcast about archaeology brought to you by the Red River Archaeology Group. I am Dr Tom Horn and today I had the immense pleasure of chatting with uh, a good pal of mine, that's Dr Emma Brownlee from the University of Cambridge. And Emma's the Ottilie Hancock Research Fellow in Archaeology at Girton College, Cambridge and a Macdonald Institute for Archaeological Research Fellow. Um, she did her PhD in burial practices, um, a study of cultural and religious cohesion of early medieval Europe. Um, her research interests um, focus on the early medieval period, um, particularly with a focus on variation in European burial practices between the 5th and the 10th century. And um, Emma's work is generally interdisciplinary. It combines geospatial and statistical analysis with historical and anthropological research. And today I was specifically talking to her about her brilliant work in the phenomenon of bed burials. Um, so people who were buried um, on bed or bed-like structures in uh, early medieval Europe. So um, without further ado, um, let's uh, get to the episode. Let's do it. Emma, um, thank you so much for, for joining us today. It's very kind of you. And um, I suppose the first questions are really just the obvious questions. Um, your expertise is on bed burials in the early medieval period. Um, so just to start with, what is a, a bed burial, particularly in the early medieval period? What period were they popular and where are we sort of generally finding them? Yeah, so a bed burial is really exactly what it sounds like. Um, it's when the dead body, rather than just being placed in the ground um, or in a coffin, uh, it was placed in a bed for the burial. Um, so yeah, the bed would go into the grave and the body would be laid out on top of it with maybe some other objects around it um, or sometimes just the bed. Uh, and it's quite a rare rite but it is something that is seen right across the whole early medieval time period um, and across Europe as well. So the earliest examples we have are from Slovakia and they date to the early fifth century. Um, and then we have a lot that you find in Southern Germany and along the Rhine Valley, and they date more to the sixth and seventh centuries. Um, you get quite a few in England dating to the seventh century. And then the latest ones you find are in Scandinavia. Um, so there we're talking more 9th, 10th century. So even though there's not very many of them, geographically, they're really widespread. Um, and the, use, the the length of time they were used for is also quite long. And I think we'll talk a bit about status, uh, you know, the status of these type of burials later. Mm -hmm. But, you know, what is... I suppose the way to start this is, is what, what are the families, you know, we always say that the, the, the dead don't bury themselves, what are the families and the communities, what are they trying to set, tell with this burial rite? Um, I imagine maybe it will, it will differ over, over time and, and, and uh, geography, but I mean, you know, what, you know, what is the message you think that the, their contemporaries were, were trying to tell? I mean, part of it is a status thing um, because most people would not have had their own beds um, and so by burying someone in a bed, you're showing that you're a, a rich enough family um, to be able to afford to bury uh, bury at one of those structures. Um, but I think there's also something a little bit more emotional about it as well. Um, the part of it is you're showing you have this concern for the comfort of the dead person. Um, you know, you want to you want to bury them in a way that um, makes them comfortable in the ground. You know, even though Technically, that might not be necessity. Um, I think it shows this this real care for who the person was. And is, you know, in, in terms of, are we talking about are, are there kind of pillows? I think that's something I, you hear about. And I presumably that's mainly just with some survivals and very rare instances of, of the fabric. Maybe perhaps if, if they're feather pillows, are we talking also about a sort of, you know, duvets or... Is a gr growing up in Glasgow, the continental quilts, you know, such sheets. Um, are there mattresses? In terms of comfort, what, what are we looking at in the structure of the bed? Yeah, it can be quite difficult to see that because, of course, it depends on the preservation conditions. Um, so there's some cases where it it seems like um, they were just laid in the bed without very much else 
but maybe we just can't see what was there. Um, but there are some great examples, particularly from the Scandinavian ones, where you have people lying on mattresses. Um, and so we can see in the ground these la layers of leather and then layers of feathers and then another layer of leather. And, you know, it's all sort of compressed in the ground, um, but you can see that that was once a mattress. Um, and actually from um, the burials at Valskerda, so the big ship cemetery there, um, the ships that have evidence for beds, they are just mattresses, but we can see that the dead body was laid out on a mattress. So, you know, it's a, you, it's a slightly different message there if you haven't got the frame, if you haven't got that high status object, um, but that message of comfort is still very much there. So that there's definitely a, a language of comfort, basically, that, that that's coming yeah. coming yeah. through. But for for you know those ones, and we'll talk a bit about the the the, the famous Scandinavian ones, uh, perhaps a bit later. But in terms of just for the sheer size, if you're not just putting somebody into the smallest possible grave grave cut, what sort of investment do you get from oh, out out with the bed? And we'll talk about the grave goods um, that accompany many of these burials as well. The substructure we're talking it does it have to be a mound then essentially if, you, if you're in a bed burial is there a lot of investment in that aspect of the right it doesn't have to be a mound but it often is um and it's often quite a big chamber grave as well um so you they will dig a, a space that is much bigger than is necessary just to put the bed in um partially so they can put lots of other objects in along with it um and I mean, some of them are just very simple cuts in the ground um, where you just put the bed um, and there's no sign of a mound. But lots of them do have that extra level of investment um, that even, even once the grave is covered up, they go out of their way to mark it as being a special grave by building the mound over it. And I suppose that that leads on into, again, just returning to that question of, of status, I mean, you know, what do we infer from these structures, the addition of a bed? Because I imagine you'll tell me that beds are, you know, I, I think you go into more detail saying that they're they're quite rare to have in their medieval period. Hmm. Um, so you just tell us a bit more about the status and then maybe also a little bit about anything to do with gender splits and sort of age range. Do we do we also have children, for example? So yeah, you just go into a little bit about the people that are, are buried in these. Yeah, so having your own bed in the early medieval period is probably quite an unusual thing. Um, you know, they don't survive well in the archaeological record always, so we don't have as much evidence as we might like for it. Um, but we think a lot of people would have um, slept on on mats, um, on blankets, maybe um, sort of structures built into the side of the house. Um, so having your own bed frame just for yourself, that, you know, it, it takes a lot of skill to make that sort of frame. Um, there's the, the value of the wood and the craftsmanship involved. Um, so that is a, a high status thing. Um, in terms of the, the types of people who are being buried in beds, uh, it's a real range. Um, but one of the interesting things is that it does vary geographically. Um, so we see men and women buried in them um, right across Europe, apart from in England where it is mostly just women who are being buried in the beds. Um, but we do also see some children as well. Uh, not very many of them, um, but one of the most famous examples um, is this burial from underneath Cologne Cathedral. Uh, and that's the burial of a five to six year old boy. Um, and he was placed in a bed, um, almost, almost a cot we might call it because it's clearly built for him. It's quite a small one. Um, and so, yeah, he's under under the cathedrals um, and with quite a lot of objects with him. So a very, very high status burial. Uh, but interestingly, we don't really see those children's burials in England again. Um, so England is looking quite different to the rest of the continent based on who is being given burial in a bed. And again, because I'm clearly obsessed with 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 the beds themselves, um, says a lot about me as an archaeologist, perhaps than the people. <laughs> <laughs> but um, you, you're talking about the the the, you, the beds there and beds for maybe a cot. But I mean, I think there are two main sorts of of bed types, and maybe you can tell us a little bit more about them. And then I suppose the, the question I have is, 
are these sort of the classic heirloom item? And for non-archaeologists, that's maybe, you know, you, 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 posh families used to say you would inherit your furniture. Um, is, is it, are these things that are being handed down? Can Is there a sort of disconnect or an earlier dating for the beds as opposed to to, to, to the burials? Or, or in some cases, are, do you think they're made bespoke for, for the grave? Yeah. Um, so there, I would actually say there's three different types of beds rather than two. Um, with a few that don't really fit neatly into the categories. Um, but so some of the simplest ones you see are what we call crate beds. Um, and they can be quite difficult to tell apart from coffins in the archaeological record because they are basically just boxes um, that would have been filled with mattresses. But once that uh, organic evidence from the mattresses goes, you're just left with this staining of a wooden box and telling that apart from a coffin, if you haven't got great preservation conditions, that can be quite tricky to do. Um, and then you've got uh, what we call baluster beds, which is like a step up from the crate beds. So they are quite a bit fancier. Um, there's more work that's gone into, uh, into decorating them. So they've got turned elements, um, these little decorative balusters along the side that have been turned on a lathe. Um, and but but they function quite similar to the crate ones in that they are kind of boxy and you, you put the mattresses in them. Um, and then we have the English ones, which look different again. Uh, so our evidence from England is a little bit different to the continent because where we have continental beds, we know about them where you, uh, we know about them because you have excellent organic preservation. And so you actually have the wooden bed frames preserved. Uh, and in England, we don't have that. Um, we don't have any preserved bed frames. But what we do have are these really distinctive metal fittings um, that we, we know came from beds. So you get little iron cleats, um, which were used to hold the sides of the bed together. Um, and then you get these things called eyelets, which are like little loops. Um, and they would have been used in the bed to, to support the mattress. So you'd have a series of these little loops down each side. Um, and then you'd string some fabric between them um, and that would that would hold up the mattress. Um, and you also get headboard stays. So curved bits of metal that would have been used to prop up the headboard for the bed. Um, and none of the continental ones have any of those sorts of metal fittings. Um, so the continental ones are, are just more the box style. Um, and I guess the English ones look a little bit more like what we would think of as a bed nowadays. What was the second part of that question? You asked me something else. Um, didn't you? Yes. So, do you get the sense, um, or you know that where you get the evidence? I appreciate that it's fairly rare that these are sort of heirloom items, or there's it made mm. bespoke for the grave. So, a lot of people have argued that they must have been made specifically for the grave because they're really narrow. Uh, so I think the narrowest one is about 40 centimetres wide. And if you think of trying to sleep in a bed that's 40 centimetres wide, that's you maybe wouldn't think that was the most comfortable thing to do. Um, but then you have evidence from others that show that they've been repaired over time or that they've been modified in some way to fit into the grave. Um, so the boy's bed in Cologne Cathedral, that actually had the legs of it sawn off before it was put in the grave. And you'd think if you were building something specifically for funerary purposes, then you'd, you'd be able to make it fit. Um, so some of the English ones as well, um, you can see the way they've been repaired, so where extra cleats have been added over time. Um, and some of them have also been dismantled before putting them in the grave. And again, I think that's probably to do with them not quite fitting in the hole that has been dug. Um, but suggest that, yeah, these were used over a longer period of time. And yeah, because they are high status objects, it's something that you would end up passing down through the family line, I think. And that's, I mean, as a, as a Viking archaeologist, makes you think you know, a little bit about, again, more about the people, because I can remember, you'll probably know the, the Scar boat burial, where I think the, mm -hmm. the, 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 there's a male, there's a, 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 an elderly female and a, maybe a young child in there as well. But I think his legs have been broken to sort of fit him into essentially this this bed. So they can be quite brutal in the early medieval mm -hmm. period. If if you don't fit, they will they will make you sort of fit. But this is I an mean, interesting part. I think I 
reading about your research was this idea the sort of that you get in Victorian Edwardian uh, headstones you see not not dead only sleeping and you discuss mm. it in your 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 latest article that they're you know are they they're not really deathbeds but they're they're sort of you know they're they're comfortable spaces where you're lying to await the 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 resurrection is is that a correct characterization yeah and it's almost like um one of the things you're trying to get across with the bed is that continuation of life um and I've got that idea of sleeping uh, for the resurrection is you know, only really applicable in a Christian context. Um, and we do find them, we do find the beds in non-Christian contexts as well. Um, but I think that idea that the dead are just sleeping is quite a universal one and isn't just something that's the preserve of Christianity. Um, so in quite a few other early medieval burials, you get people positioned in certain ways, um, like as if they've they've got their hands up by their face as if they're sleeping. Um, so even you know, when you don't have a bed, there are plenty of ways of carrying out the funerary rite that emphasizes sleep um, and the continuation of the person uh, and that death isn't this final end for them. So that's the, the sort of because you're very much an interdisciplinary scientist and researcher. So you that's almost at the anthropolog anthropological side coming yeah. into as well it's just something that we sort of naturally do as, as humans but so then I mean I think a lot of them and we'll go into a little bit more that do show Christian influence and what what where's this influence coming from where do you think the the origins are you know you might be discussing things like you know Coptic or Byzantine Christianity in your answer I sound like an exam paper there um <laughs> could you just tell us a little bit about the the origins yeah um so one of the interesting things when you try and look at beds at the broader scale and where they've come from um, is that you also see bed burials in Coptic Egypt. Uh, they're a bit earlier than the ones you see in Europe. Um, so third to fifth century is, is when some of the examples we've got are from. Um, they don't always have great provenance, the Egyptian examples, so it's, it's a little bit trickier to work out. Um, but the styles of some of those Coptic beds are really remarkably similar to the beds that we see in Western Europe. Uh, and that's particularly the baluster style beds. So where you've got those turned, lathe turned balusters are, as a form of decoration. That's something that links the, the Coptic world with, the, um, with Western Europe. Um, and a lot of our uh, depictions of beds in the um, documentary sources come from the Byzantine world. So we see these images of beds which are being given from the Byzantine court um, to the Frankish court. And of course, I'm not saying that you know, we didn't have beds before that, um, but that particular style of furniture does seem to be quite heavily influenced by Byzantium. Um, and one of the things I find really interesting is that when you look at the, the chronological and geographical distributions, you know, the earliest examples of beds that we have are the most easterly. Um, so you've got one in Slovakia, um, and then you've got one that's in Bavaria, uh, but on the Danube. Um, and the Danube River at this time was this really key artery for travel and contact between the east and west. So... I mean, it's slightly circumstantial evidence, but pulling it all together, you can sort of see how very broadly um, the styles of beds and this, this custom of bed burial may have travelled from Egypt through Byzantium into the West. And, you know, I think we can now move on to the, 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 some of the really cool stuff, the, the grave goods. Is that influence coming through in, in the grave goods? in terms of you know overtly christian uh items um i know we'll discuss this later in in relation to to some other case studies like harpole in in england but if you just tell us a little bit about the grave goods just in general and maybe specifically the the christian element that's in them so there's quite a broad range of furnishing that you see uh some of them do have nothing they only have the bed and that's the only object in the grave uh, but that's not very typical most of them are much more richly furnished. Um, so, yeah, we could go back to the, the Cologne Cathedral example again, because it's, it's one of the most iconic ones. Um, and the little boy who was buried in that grave, uh, he had this range of weapons with him, um, some of which were adult weapons, so he probably couldn't have used them. Um, but some of them were child-sized weapons. 
Um, so he has a helmet, a sword, um, a spear, and he also had a load of food offerings with him, um, like nuts and dates and things like that, um, as well as glass vessels um, and, and other, other containers, bronze basins, things like that. Um, but it's the, the, the Christian style objects that you find in some graves have attracted a lot of attention. Uh, and this is more the case in an English context than it is elsewhere. Um, so some of the most famous English examples have uh, crosses within the grave. Um, so we could talk about the Trumpington bed burial, which is one I'm very familiar with because it's uh, from just outside of Cambridge, where I'm based. And it's a very small object. Um, it's only uh, two, two or three centimetres diameter. Uh, but it's this beautiful golden garnet cloisonné cross. Um, so very finely made, um, really high status, really beautiful. And you find that sort of thing in a few other bed burials as well. Uh, but less so on the continent. Um, I can think of two bed burials on the continent that have this explicitly Christian imagery with them. Uh, one of them is a grave that has a gold foil cross in it. Um, so not quite as nice as some of the English crosses. It's quite a lot more, um, it, it's a lot more fragile uh, and probably was made for the grave because it's very, very thin gold. It wouldn't last very long if you were wearing it. Um, and the other continental example with uh, Christian style grave goods um, is from a place called Falheim Renweg. Um, and the only object in the grave other than the bed was this chest that had images of angels carved on the side. So there's those few with Christian imagery, uh, but quite a lot of them have the, the range of objects that you would expect to find in any high status, rich early medieval grave. And, and this is it, isn't it? I think you cover it again in your research. It's, it's in this sort of it's a syncretic period. I remember studying sort of Gregory of Tours in that period. Mm -hmm. He's talking about sort of you know sort of sixth century Gaul when people are still experimenting with with Christianity. To put it in, in that sense, so grave goods are 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 still part of even Christian rites, uh, at least in the earlier part of the period you study. Is that is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's no sign in that seventh eighth century really that Christianity has a problem with grave goods. Um, or even that they're that interested in how people are being buried. Um, it's not something that the church at that point felt the need to really stamp their control on. So you still get that, that continuation of earlier customs, even if they're starting to bring some, some Christian imagery into it. Could you give just us and the, the, you know, the listeners um, a sketch of the picture um, relating to bed burials in, the, in, in England in, in the early medieval period? Yeah, so there are around 18 or 19 examples of these bed burials, um, depending on what you count as a definite versus a possible bed burial. And as, as I was saying before, they really stand out because um, they all date to the 7th century, these burials in England. Um, they are all burials of women. Um, and they're of quite a distinct style of bed when you compare them to the, the broader corpus of beds that we have. Um, so there's a particular little concentration of them in the sort of Cambridgeshire, East Anglian area. Um, and then there's another concentration in the southwest, sort of around Wiltshire. Um, and then there's a couple of other examples dotted around the place, like there's one up in Derbyshire, um, there's one in Yorkshire. But mostly they seem to be this, this southern phenomenon. So if, if I'm a German researcher, I've, I've looked at the, the concentrations in Bavaria and, and Rhineland and, and elsewhere in, in Central Continental Europe, what would surprise me? What, what are the kind of differences then between the sort of bed burials that I've been used to seeing and what, what's happening in England? Um, so I think you'd be surprised by just the, the difference in the level of evidence you know, if you're looking at the continental ones, you are dealing with what is very recognizably a bed frame. Whereas when you're looking at the English ones, you're looking at these little small bits of metal that are being found in graves. Um, and then you've got to try and reconstruct that into, into what it would have looked like. It's not always easy to see. Um, just because our, our organic preservation conditions are not quite as good as they are with, with some of the continental cemeteries.
And just a little bit of background on that is that is the soil just sort of more acidic? Um, what, what are the sort of just the sort of scientific reasons behind that? Yeah, it's to do with um, acidic soils um, and drier soils as well. Um, so probably one of the more famous German sites is a site called Oberflacht. Um, and we've got 21 bed burials just from that one single site in southern Germany. Uh, and that's because the ground is really waterlogged. Um, and it just so happens that in England, we, ha we haven't got cemeteries in those sorts of waterlogged conditions that would allow the wood to preserve. I mean, maybe maybe there's still some out there to find. That would be really, really great. Uh, ah. But at the moment, we don't have any. <laughs> but that's the thing. You say you, you get this wonderful opportunity to sort of be, be a detective. And so I mean, tell us a little bit more about these, these metal fittings that, that survive and just, I mean, there won't be a typical uh, 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 early medieval uh, bed burial in England, but just give us maybe an impression of, again, if you if you found one tomorrow, what the kind of, what would you find in terms of the metal fittings and what type of bed would it sort of most likely be compared to the examples that we have at the moment? Mm -hmm. um, so typically you have a series of little metal cleats, which are basically little rectangular pieces of iron um, that will go down the sides of the grave. Um, and they would have been the bits that we used to hold the various planks of wood together that made the bed. Um, and then within that, um, so you have, yeah, you have the row of cleats. And then within that, you might have uh, a row of eyelets. So little hoops of iron um, would have been used to support the base of the bed. Um, and then at the head end, um, you might find two of these long curved strips of iron, um, and they were used to prop up the headboard for the bed. Sometimes, and, the different, and, the, and sorry, just saying the difference yeah. then is the cleats. The cleats are there to support. I, I think I read that the difference is it's the base of the beds. It's quite a big difference between between the sort of different uh, bed bed burials. Yeah. So with a lot of the continental ones, you have solid wooden bases and um, so it's almost like a trough that you you fill it up with the bedding um whereas the english ones have these series of eyelets along the base um so only the sides of the bed would have been wooden um and then the eyelets are used where you the eyelets are used to um create this lattice like base so you thread fabric across the base of the bed from side to side um, and it would have created, I think, a more comfortable bed than maybe the wooden base ones. And OK, so you've described very well um, this idea of, of what the beds might look like. You're sort of lying, you're almost suspended. It's it's comfortable for the living and, and presumably for for the dead. Um, and we've talked about the Christian elements uh, earlier in this. What are we then finding in the graves that are just the grave goods anyway in England specifically? And just maybe any of the, the highlights in terms of the, because I think some of the, the stuff that's buried with them are incredible sort of uh, examples of Christian artwork. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so because these bed burials date to the seventh century, they're dating to a period when grave good use generally is in decline. So fewer and fewer people have objects in their graves. Uh, and when they do, it tends to be quite simple things. So things like knives, things like buckles, um, you know, your basic dress accessories. Uh, and this is one of the reasons why the bed burials stand out, because they have much richer material with them. Um, they still don't have a large number of objects necessarily, but not, at least not the ones in England. Um, but the objects that they do have are high quality. Um, so if we think of the Trumpington uh, bed burial, um, she doesn't have very much with her and she's got a knife, but she also has um, this beautiful little golden garnet cloisonné cross. And so that's a, a technique where you cut little bits of garnets um, and set them in gold. Um, if you think of some of the objects from Sutton Hoo, so the, um, the shoulder clasps from Sutton Hoo, um, that's a cloisonné style. Uh, it's quite technical, it's quite fiddly to do, especially if you're working on a very small scale. Yeah, the yeah. Trumpington woman, as well as this cross, she also has a pair of linked pins. Um, so again, gold, uh, again, garnet, um, very finely made. And they would probably have been used to pin a veil to her head. So we can get a little bit of a sense from that of how she was dressed more generally. And that's maybe just a, a little bit here on 
examples of clothing. There's an archaeologist, a lot of clothing survivals that you get will be mineralized, basically where the, the, the metal has um, sort of oxidized in the grave. And if it's in contact with material, sometimes you'll get little sort of ghostly uh, impressions and you can figure out maybe the, the type of it's a silk or a wool or the quality of, of, of either of them in terms of weaving. In terms of clothing, what, what other, I mean, because sometimes with dress fittings you can get, so you can get an idea as you're saying, this sort of style of clothes. What clothes are these, I say, generally women in 7th century England being buried with in these bed burials, as far as you can tell? Yeah, that is a little bit difficult, actually, um, because in this period, um, women aren't being buried with the sorts of brooches that they were in the earlier periods. And it's those brooches that are really important for helping to distinguish uh, the, the different fabrics that they're buried with. Um, so if you have someone like Trumpington, where she's only really got the gold objects in her grave, um, though, because gold is quite an inert metal, and that's one of the reasons why it's so valuable, is that it doesn't decay and it doesn't rust. So you don't pick up the fabric impressions on them in quite the same way. Um, I think the only way of doing that would for the Trumpington woman, at least, would be her knife. Um, although I cannot remember off the top of my head if there are fabric impressions on that particular knife. Um, so it's it's a little bit difficult to do for the seventh century burials, actually. It, it betrays my 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 Vikingists uh, part mm -hmm. of my <laughs> <laughs> of my life. I assume everything has just got fabric impressions on the many many brooches uh, that everybody is wearing. Yeah. But that's well, but the that's, yeah. Um, the uh, the metal fittings on the beds, um, they don't have so much the clothing on them, but you can see imprints from the um, the mattresses and the blankets and the fabrics that uh, would have made up the bedding. So you can see the imprints on those objects, just not so much on the dress accessories because the dress accessories oh. aren't really there. That's that that's good to know. But maybe I think you'll tell us a wee bit more about the context of these burials that we can maybe have a an idea of 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 what these these women would have been wearing. But before we go on to that, um, and I know you've 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 looked at the work of um, Dr. Sam Leggett, who's the uh, I know well uh, as well, and Dr. Alice Rose, and you, you're now looking you you know if in the few instances where um, in, in Europe as well as in England where you have survival, sometimes it's just bits of teeth as we'll discover. Um, this more scientific uh, uh, analysis of, of the bodies, isotopic analysis, and maybe just, you know, and again, again, it sounds like an exam, but in your answer, maybe talk about what this tells us about the, the origins and the mobility of the women that are in uh, specifically the, 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 the graves in, in England. Mm -hmm. So something I'm working on at the moment with, um, with Sam Leggett and Alice Rose uh, is this um, isotopic analysis of some of the bed burials. Uh, so they are very much the isotope specialists, and you know I am here to provide the, the broader archaeological context. Uh, but what they have done is look at um, isotopes from, from three of these bed burials. Um, so the Trumpington one, and two burials from Edix Hill, which is another site that's near Cambridge. Um, so we've got a little Cambridgeshire cluster. Uh, and they have looked at the oxygen and the strontium isotopes in the teeth of these women. So broadly speaking, oxygen tells you about the uh, climate that someone grew up in. So whether or not they were in a, a colder climate or a hotter climate. Um, and strontium tells you a little bit about the underlying geology that they grew up on. And um, so that's something that can be really variable, even within quite small areas. So that one's a, a bit tricky to use. Um, but combining the information from the two can help you narrow down where some of these women grew up. Uh, and we can certainly say whether or not they grew up in the same place they were buried or not. Um, and what's really interesting is that the three women that they have sampled, uh, none of them grew up in anywhere in the British Isles. Um, so if the oxygen in particular tells us that they were all coming from a colder climate. Um, which could theoretically be Scandinavia, um, but it could also be more Central Europe. So sort of Alpine regions is also a possibility. Um, it, it's very difficult to narrow it down for certain where someone's from, but you can start to get a sense of that. So 
I think this is now your sort of big reveal, big finale, then mm -hmm. bringing together um, the evidence of the, 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 the beds themselves, the, the grave goods or, 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 or not, mm -hmm. and the, this uh, isotopic uh, analysis that your colleagues are, are looking at specifically. What have you discovered about the sort of mobility of, of these women and particularly with the, with the Christian element in there? Um, I think you, your, your, your thesis is it's maybe very, very closely linked to the spread of, of Christianity in, in Anglo-Saxon England. Yeah, so if you combine um, all of the evidence for mobility from those isotopes, um, plus the fact that the bed burial rite is so much more restricted in England than it is elsewhere, I think it's quite likely that what we're seeing is the, the, the bed burial rite was imported into England from the continent, specifically by women in the seventh century. And if you're thinking about why women might be moving around in the seventh century, well, Christianization is a really obvious explanation for that, um, because the seventh century is when you get a lot of missionaries heading over to England specifically to convert. And that's when we start seeing traces of Christian belief reappearing in the archaeological record in England. And so there's a, a couple of different ways in which women could have been involved in that. Um, one of them is this pr process of exogamy, um, so where women travel to marry. And we've got lots of historical accounts of Christian women marrying into non-Christian families specifically to convert those Christian families. Um, so the classic example of this, you've got Queen Bertha of Kent. Um, who She was a Frankish Christian princess uh, and she married the Kentish non-Christian king. Um, and we have some correspondence between her and the Pope at the time that talks about how it's part of her responsibility as a, a Christian wife to convert her husband. So women were an important part of this, this conversion process through marriage. Um, and another way, another way that um, Christianity and women's mobility was linked uh, was through the establishment of religious houses. So nunneries, um, although a lot of them weren't just, just women in this period, you would have double houses. Um, but you would have the, the mother houses in France, in Francia, uh, who would send over abbesses and nuns to help establish religious foundations in the newly Christianized England. So that provided a means of women moving around as well. And um, so I don't want to say that you know, every woman who is buried in a bed in England was probably a migrant because we don't have evidence for that. Um, but I think there is good evidence that it was imported in this very specific context and so could have been then been taken up by the rest of the English population um, and acquire these, these connotations of Christianity uh, and of femininity that bed burials elsewhere just don't have. Fantastic. And this then, so it must have been manna from heaven the, when the Harpole discovery was made. And I'll let you talk about it because you know you've actually been interviewed by the, the Washington Post about it in your role of expert in, 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 in bed burials. Um, so you can just tell us a little about people. Um, our listeners might have heard of the Harpole treasure. So if you just tell us a little bit about everything to do with that um, as much as you know and specifically you know potentially is a, a bed burial with obviously with a fantastic uh, grave good as well. Mm -hmm. So in some ways it's a little bit frustrating because you know I've just finished writing this great paper about bed burials and then six months later the best example of a bed burial anywhere in England is excavated and I can't include it because I've already finished that paper. Um, but so it was uh, excavated as part of this um, construction project. So it's development-led archaeology, um, and it was the Museum of London Archaeology, MOLA, that unit um, that excavated this particular site. Uh, and it's still quite early days, so there's still a lot of analysis still to be done on it. Um, but the objects in the grave, um, I, you know, I was talking about how some of the other bed burials are high status. This is like a whole other level. Um, so she was buried with an inc incredibly elaborate necklace. Um, the central pendant uh, was golden garnet cloisonné, 
um, but it looks like it's been reused from a book. So originally it would have been a book clasp that has then been broken down. Um, and this part of the clasp that has a cross on it has been suspended from the necklace. Um, and then surrounding that clasp, you've got some fourth century Roman coins. Um, you've got various other inset gemstones. So even you have just one of those pendants on its own would be an impressive necklace, but you've got a whole string of them together. Uh, and then the other particularly impressive grave good uh, is this silver cross, uh, possibly a processional cross. So the sort of thing that you might have carried through a church. Um, it's very fragile. It uh, was actually block lifted from the excavation and is still being excavated out of that soil block in the laboratory um, because it's quite fragile. So we don't completely know what it looks like yet, uh, but it's about 30 centimeters tall. And right at the center of it is a huge garnet set into the middle of it. And then around the edges, um, you have these silver faces that have been attached as well. So it's a really elaborate multi-part object um, would presumably have taken quite a bit of skill to make and been very visually impressive. Uh, and we, because uh, because analysis is still ongoing, um, we can't say too much yet about what sort of bed it is. Um, and they've, they've, they've lifted blocks of soil that are still being excavated, but it's looking like there are some bed fittings in there. Um, so, Mola are reasonably confident that this is a, another bed burial, even if we've still got lots of things we need to work out about it. I mean, as Emma says there, that's that's always the way. The, the good stuff is found. It, it can be like a day after you sent off a proofs or something like that. Or <laughs> it, it's it's the, the archaeology and the way that the internet and uh, knows when to break down if you're trying to record a podcast, the, the archaeology knows that somebody's writing a paper about it and then it just waits until slightly, slightly too late in that that process. So that's that's a very, actually very good insight into the, the a world of you might spend a decade or more the work of a paper and getting it published. And then yeah, a week after, a week after it goes out, they, they find something like this. So you're equally delighted and frustrated, I think is the, is, is the way to think of it. And I suppose just to really to, to, to finish up and you can tell us a wee bit more about what, what you're doing next, but what's your, sort of favorite either um, bed burial or just aspect of one maybe a, a, maybe it's a find maybe it's just uh just a narrative that, that that a find tells um could you just yeah maybe just tell us essentially your your favorite sort of um piece of research that you've encountered while while, while studying this yeah i would say my favorite bed burial is the trumpington one um, which is partially because it's really close to home. Um, you know, I can pop down the road to the Arkananth Museum in the Cambridge city centre and I can see the objects in it. Um, but that was also my first introduction to this topic. So I remember sitting in an undergraduate lecture back in 2012 um, and it was Catherine Hills who was delivering this lecture and she put up this photo uh, of the bed burial and the little cross being excavated out of it and she said oh I saw this yesterday so that was where I got I got that sense of um you know of of the sorts of discoveries that are always happening um and how that can then instantly be brought into this broader narrative um about women in early medieval England um so yeah that that's a special one more for personal reasons than rather than a, the bed itself um but yeah that one I think I think that's great I think we all as archaeologists and historians and just people just generally interested in the past there's always that one moment that sets you off on the the thing in which you're interested in it might just be saying somebody saying something uh uh that you just haven't thought of before you know you know i remember hearing about the al andalus for example and it set off mm. you know you know the the rest of my career being interested in, in in that intersection between the sort of the islamic and christian worlds in early medieval europe so um i i very much understand that and it, yeah it can it can be the slightest thing but yeah to see a photograph of something that's been freshly excavated must have just been yeah that that's going to burn uh, into your into your into your synapses and uh, mm -hmm. yeah you you told that 
really well. I think I think our listeners will get a really good idea of just that moment of when you know kind of what you're doing for a large part of the rest of your life. <laughs> um, <laughs> And yeah, so then just to finish, is there is there any other projects you're working on at the moment and um, that you'd like to tell our listeners about? Oh, so I've got quite a lot on, um, possibly too much as the, the life of an enthusiastic academic. Um, but one of the, the key things I'm working on at the moment is um, very close to home, actually. Um, so I'm employed by Girton College. Uh, and in the 19th century, an early medieval cemetery was excavated in the grounds of Girton College. And so we have some of those objects here in the college um, and some in the Arkananth Museum in the city centre. Um, and we have a diary that the excavator wrote at the time of the excavation telling us what he found. But this has never been properly published. There was a very, a very brief 1925 publication um, and there isn't an awful lot of information in it. So I think a lot of people have looked at the Girton Cemetery and have gone, oh, well, there's nothing really here. Um, the records are really bad. We can't do anything with it. But when you go back to the original excavator's diary, actually, there is quite a lot of information in there that was never published. Um, and so one of the things I'm working on is trying to, to get that information out there um, and write up the site so that more people can know about it um, and, and yeah, you use it in their research because it's a really interesting example of a site where you have late Roman to early medieval continuity, which doesn't happen very often. No, I remember writing essays about that at uh, undergraduate as well. And it was, it was one of the more tricky ones. Uh, yep. <laughs> to, 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 to everything's ambiguous essentially and uh yeah it, it might go down to whether someone maintains drains in in one town mm -hmm. uh for you know 20 years after the romans are supposedly less than and you've got to base an entire century of figuring out what happened on on that so um that's fantastic and we'll look forward to that and people can find you if they search for your name on twitter and yeah. very and yeah. you're, you're, you've got a really good personal web page um at university as well so um yeah just uh watch watch this space basically and it just remains for me to say thank you very much for your time and um yeah i i, I really did enjoy reading i mean i read your paper twice which is uh, <laughs> <laughs> we're we're old friends that's something i never thought i'd do or say or admit <laughs> um but it was absolutely absolutely fascinating and and, and just how one particular uh burial right one type of archaeology can can begin to tell this amazing narrative of an entire century and women who might have otherwise been completely uh lost to us although there is some really good historical evidence it's very very slight um but now we've got um an increasing volume of archaeological evidence that as we're recording this on international women's day i think is is um mm -hmm. just a really a, a really nice note to, to, to end it on so thank you very much Emma thank you for having me it was really great to talk about it wow well you know I'm you know I, I won't get tired of saying wow at the end of these things but it's just it's lovely to be able to speak to you know genuinely nice highly intelligent people who are just so erudite easy to speak to and can you know what we're trying to do with this podcast is just you know bring this brilliant world of archaeology to 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 people who you know haven't necessarily had the time to spend 10 years studying it but then we get yeah. someone brilliant like emma to to you know in the space of you know 40 45 minutes just bring us up into a whole new world and what did what did what did you think about that Luke? what struck me more than just a sheer knowledge involved in these kind of things is the actual passion like yourself and emma talking about this you both clearly care an awful lot about this and it, it, it strikes me actually with a lot of these conversations that we're having that like archaeology isn't doesn't seem like it's a job to a lot of you it seems to be a, a passion really and, and i kind of get the impression that and i don't want to tell your bosses this but i get the impression you'd do this even if you weren't being paid <laughs> <laughs> no comment um but, yeah it's 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 absolutely it's 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 a vocation um you know it is that sense that it is a it is a calling and yeah you, you couldn't really i just don't think you could do it um uh, for as long as we have to do it to 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 get that specific knowledge if you didn't just love it and that have that childlike sort of wonder at it 
Um, and yeah, today I got that. There's always something I find. I mean, it'd be interesting to hear what you have to say as well. There's always one bit and it could be at the beginning or, or, or the summary of a podcast. And I think it was just this mm. idea of comfort. It was the word of comfort that you, know, you just got this. I really got that sense of the moment of the family and the community who are burying this person wanted them to be comfortable and I think that's one of these things that you know a brilliant archaeologist historian can tell you and it just strips away the centuries and you can sort of say you know can you're at the graveside and you think yeah ah, right yeah. okay I see what I see what's happening and I, I yeah I, I I don't know if that was the the same for you absolutely it's the it's the human story of it, it it's what makes it about people really which is I suppose where the the empathy and understanding of of something like this is no it was great it was really interesting this one yeah, it's fascinating. Um, uh, thank you again to Dr. Emma Brownlee and uh, her employers at Girton University of Cambridge um, for, for her time. And um, yeah, so we hope you enjoy it. And uh, I'll just leave Ace producer Luke Barry just yeah. to give the outro. And uh, I'll just thank you again from my perspective. Thank you very much. So if this is your first time listening to this podcast, maybe go back, check out our archive. There's plenty of uh, podcasts there, plenty of interviews there, including one with our own Dr. Tom Horn here that uh, you might find interesting. Uh, hit the follow button, hit the like button, hit the subscribe button. If you know anybody else who would find this podcast interesting, maybe share it with them. Throw it up on your Twitter, throw it up on your Facebook. While we're on that, follow us on Twitter, follow us on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, and we'll be back again with another Shindig podcast in the future. Thank you very much.